Right. Hey, good morning, everyone. Welcome, welcome. I'm glad that you're here to worship uh, our God together. Uh, if you're new here, my name is Chase. I'm the lead minister, uh, and we got a, a, a very good service planned for you this morning. Uh, so we'll take some time to sing some songs together and, and praise in honor of our God. Uh, we'll take some time to pray together as a community of believers and people of faith. We're also going to take time to open up God's Word uh, and see how it applies to our life today. Uh, and we'll do that through Scripture reading. We'll do that through the sermon later on. But one thing that we do, and if you're new here, uh, one thing that we do every single week is that we take communion together. And communion is also known as the Lord's Supper. And, and that is where we celebrate what Christ has done for us by being the sacrifice on the cross, the atonement for our sins. Uh, and so we will take that together as the family of God and you're welcome to come to the table with that as well. Uh, but if you would, just join me in a word of prayer as we seek to prepare our hearts and our minds uh, for worship, but also to be a living sacrifice unto God, right? Uh, this is our act of worship. And so we want to think of Romans 12, 1 and 2, as we, as we prepare uh, this morning to worship Him. So bow your heads with me. Heavenly Father, we, we come before you and we give you thanks. We give you thanks for uh, the good things that you have given us this week, that, that you have provided endurance and perseverance and patience in the hard things. And Lord, as we come together as the body of Christ, may we encourage and support one another. But may we also come before you in just thanks and in celebration for what Christ has done and continues to do in our lives, but also for what you have done, Lord, by making a way for us, by, by making us white as snow, by, by calling us clean and welcoming us to your kingdom. So Lord, as we come before you, may we be a living sacrifice as our true act of worship before you today. We give this time to you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Would you please stand and sing as we proclaim that Jesus is truly our everything.
And also, kids, remember you stay in here for now. <laughs> Excuse me. a seat. We have a few announcements. We kind of gather back together here. Hey, first off, if you are available tonight, there's apparently a football game going on. If you're a Lions fan or you're from the state of Michigan, you don't care about that part. <laughs> However, the church will be open tonight if you guys want to come hang out, have some good food, play some games. Uh, last year, just so you know, you don't want to miss this. Last year, I fell out of a chair playing a card game called the Oregon Trail, which is based on a computer game, which is based on history, uh, and I tore a hole in my jeans. So, at the minimum, come watch me act a fool and uh, play some games and hang out, have some good food. Uh, but that will be tonight, uh, 6 p.m., the doors will be open, 6.30, the game will be on, uh, I guess, on this big screen here. No one's watching it, like I said. The lines aren't in it, so it's okay. Also, coming up next weekend, during services, before, after, uh, primarily before and between services, uh, there is going to be a ministry fair going on out in the lobby. What that means is this. We're going to have tables set up for the different areas of ministry at the church, uh, and there will be opportunities for you to, 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 one, check out what happens here. Maybe you're newer and, and want to see what the missions are that we have here, the different ministries. Uh, but also, maybe you're looking to plug in, and there's a chance to talk with volunteers, a chance to talk with the, mil uh, the ministry leaders of those different areas, uh, and get to know more about those ministries. Uh, and maybe, maybe you're not at a place where you want to volunteer or you don't have the availability to volunteer. We also will have ways for you to stop and check out and pray for each of our different ministries. Because, uh, friends, we really believe from the power of prayer that uh, all things are made possible in God. So we would love to have even a uh, spiritual backing of our ministries through prayer would be great. So come check us that out. QR code on the screen there. We'll take you to our website if you want to check out each individual ministry there. But starting, or not starting, excuse me, uh, starting and ending next week, we'll have our ministry fair out in the lobby. Also coming up, February 25th, ICRH will be here at First Church for a week or so. Uh, we need help with that setup and tear down. So that Sunday, if you are willing and able, if you could stay after, help us get that set up. Uh, they come in and drop off many things. We got to tear down the sanctuary get some rooms prepped, uh, and help get them set up. And then there will be sign-ups starting very soon here to get signed up to uh, come in uh, and hang out with some of those people and work on some meals and, and fellowship together. So more coming on that. We will direct you to Miss Kaylin if you don't know who she is, and she kind of charges that for us. But we will have all of that set up here real soon. Also coming up April 18th through the 20th, is the Michigan Christian Convention. This is a gathering of the Churches of Christ and Christian churches in our state and region. We're going to be gathering at Great Lakes Christian College. Once again, that's April 18th through the 20th. This is free to you, church. We have several that are signed up already, but the hope is that many of you sign up and we go together uh, and we worship God together with other churches. We're going to be in the book of Ephesians. Uh, and I've said this a few times, but there are a few Speakers on that screen you may know, Bob Russell and Mark Christian stand out to me. 
uh, but just brilliant gentlemen that are going to, uh, and, and ladies that are going to bring a, a good word of God uh, and a good time of fellowship together. So if you're available, April 18th through the 20th, immeasurably more Michigan Christian Convention. And then we have all of our midweek things coming up. We have our, our Bible study Tuesday with Coffee with Chase at 8 a.m. We have our midweek service, which I want to invite you, this midweek service, uh, Pastor Corbin's going to be preaching here for the last time uh, before he makes his adventure to Indiana. So we encourage you to come out and hang out and, uh, and support him and hear a good word from, from his mouth. Uh, that will be this Wednesday at 6 p.m. And also the men will be meeting this week for men's Bible study at the same time, 6 p.m. here at the church. Uh, and as always, we have children programming. So if you have young ones, bring them along. Uh, they'll be working with Miss Ellen and working on some programming for Easter. So uh, be excited for that. And then finally... We have our Connect card. If, if you have anything that you want to get to us, information, prayer requests, would like to meet with us, uh, and this is just sometimes the quickest way to get that going, fill out a Connect card, put it in the giving box, and we will reach out to you guys throughout the week. I do have one more thing I'd like to announce. February 25th is going to be Corbin's last Sunday here. Uh, yeah, I know, right? It actually is going to come to fruition at some point. Uh, February 25th is that day. So what that means is this, church. We have two services now. We don't always have the opportunity to gather all of you together. Uh, so what we're going to do is between services on February 25th, we're going to have an extended period of time between services in which we can all hang out with Corbin and Sydney and, and bless them, pray for them and their ministry moving forward, uh, and just kind of have that, uh, those last moments before they make a big trek down to Indiana. Uh, I say big trek, but really, they're not that far away, friends. This won't be the last time that uh, we see or worship with our friends, uh, Corbin and Sydney. So we're really excited for what God is going to do through them on their adventures. But if you're available, please uh, hang out with us February 25th. Make sure that you have a chance that you stop and talk with them and the ministry that they've done here. Uh, convey to them how important that's been uh, to everything that this church has been doing over the last few years. Uh, Jason said this morning, Corbin has been inviting us into a time of worship in this place for a couple years now. That has significant uh, importance and value in our ministry. Uh, so thank them for that and, and pray for them as they move on to their new journeys here. Uh, if you would, pray with me now, and then we will continue to worship together. Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you for this wonderful morning. Thank you for this congregation, these people. Lord, we're so thankful to be your church and to have your spirit dwell here. Remind us of its presence, Lord. Reveal to it within us that you are indeed here. Lord, thank you for these moments, these times of worship, the words that we'll hear. Lord, thank you for the life that you live, the point of death on a cross, the resurrection of life that you for us. We love you, Lord. We pray in your wonderful name. Amen. Would you please stand and sing?
about how, um, sorry, I had it pulled up here. I'm just going to kind of try to quote it, but um, that there's a master of the great house. And this has been a passage that I've really embodied in in my heart and soul over the past two and a half years um, of of ministry here. And it says that um, my heart was made of wood and that my thoughts would dishonor you and that I was made of clay. um, And it's a proclamation of, Lord, make me a vessel for honor, useful for the master and we put away the things of the old life. Um, This is actually a song um, that I wrote, and I was encouraged to share it with you all um, about two weeks, one to two weeks after serving here. um, It was a song that just came to my heart after reading 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 20 through 26, and it just became um, just kind of the the vision for the ministry here, the the worship ministry, um, and just how we put God first. And what's interesting is this passage, um, actually, it's not really talking about music. It's purely talking about the service for the Lord, and it's really just been on my heart on these past three years. I know I quote it to the team all the time, and uh, it's really just straight from Scripture. I'm certainly no poet. It's not musically impressive. It's really just meant for you all to proclaim and sing, and I hope that these words will rest on your heart. And actually, I know they will, because the Lord also says that my words will not return unto me void in the book of Isaiah. So let us sing this song um, together to the Lord.
Good morning. Uh, at this time, our kids are dismissed to go upstairs. All right. They didn't want to go earlier, or they wanted to go earlier, but I heard a, one of the kids, hey, I want to go, I want to go. <clears throat> we are being invited by Christ to gather around something that he instituted many years ago. And it is to share in the remembrance of his sacrifice. I want to share from John chapter 6 this morning, verses 43 through 51. And by sharing, I mean we take part in taking a piece of bread in a cup representing his body given and his blood shed on behalf of our sins. With Jesus in this chapter would refer to himself as the bread of life. And I want to give you a little backdrop before I, I read verses 43 through 51. Jesus was talking to the crowd, 
And the Jews in the crowd started to have this discussion by what Jesus was saying. And Jesus made the comment, I have come down from heaven. This is important because when he goes into this verse, he starts talking about the manna that came down to their forefathers. And he said, this manna did not sustain or give you eternal life. But he says, I have something that will. And that's where he said, I am the bread of life. And so I'd like to read verses 42 through 51. Jesus answered them, Do not grumble among yourselves. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. It is written in the prophets, and they will be taught by God. Everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me, not that anyone has seen the Father except he who is from God. He has seen the Father. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness, and they died. This is the bread that comes down from heaven, so that no one may eat of it and not die, so that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that comes down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I will give for eternal life of the world is my flesh. So Jesus is the bread of life. When he died on the cross, it was the atonement for our sins. In fact, when he's on the cross, that atonement was once and for all. And he said, it is finished. And so he has called us to participate in remembering that sacrifice. So each and every Sunday we gather as a body to remember Christ and his sacrifice for us. And what a blessing it is to be able to gather around the table that he instituted and to share in that moment that he is the bread of life and he is the one who sustains our lives for eternal life. The ushers will now pass out the bread and the juice. And as you have been served those, please hold on to them and then we'll pray together and then partake together. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the opportunity to gather here this morning to share in what you instituted. And Father, to be blessed in knowing that you are the one who offers eternal life through your sacrifice. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for Jesus. Thank you for him being the bread of life and the atonement for our sins. Father, bless this time now as we remember Jesus and what he's done for us. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.
Now the bread and the cup representing Christ's body and blood shed on our behalf. As we enter into a time of giving this morning, I want to share with you a quote. Apparently, I thought this quote was important. I wrote it down, but then I forgot to attribute to who said it. So I don't know who said it, but I like the quote. I'd like to share that this morning. The application of God's word, not information, leads to transformation. So very simply, applying God's word to our lives. Uh, I like what apply means. It means just to put on, to put on God's word. Romans 12, 2, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Let's pray for our offering this morning. Father, thank you so much. Father, thank you for the opportunity to give. Thank you for the blessings that you've given us. May we give sacrificially and give from our hearts this morning. Father, may we wear your word on our hearts and apply your word to our lives so that it may be witnesses to others and be a light to others. Father, pray that you work in us and through us so that gospel of truth may reach around the world. Thank you for the opportunity to participate in the giving, Father. We've asked a blessing upon this giving that you Bless this offering to continue the work that you have asked us to do. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to bring the word of God to you this morning. We're going to be in Mark chapter 2. There will be a Bible in the pew in front of you. You can look it up on your device. If you do not own a Bible, please see one of our staff members. We would love uh, to put one of those in your hands. Uh, it will be on the screen, though, here behind me. Uh, so we will read. Mark 2, 1 through 5 says, A few days later, when Jesus again entered Capernaum, the people heard that he had come home. They gathered in such large numbers that there was no room left, not even outside the door, and he preached the word to them. And some of them came, bringing to them a paralyzed man carried by four of them. Since they could not get him to Jesus because of the crowd, they made an opening in the roof above Jesus by digging through it and lowering the man, man on the mat who was, he was lying on. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralyzed man, Son, your sins are forgiven. This is the word of the Lord. Uh, good morning again, folks. Glad to see you all. Um, I do want to bring this up because we haven't talked about it in announcement time, but these baby bottles are still out in the foyer. Um, we're collecting these to the end of the month. And so if you have not grabbed one yet and put some change in it or a check or some cash, whatever, um, pick that up. It goes to Life Choices. They are 100% private funded. All right, so it, it relies on you and me in order to uh, get the care in our community for them. So 
just want to encourage you, pick up a baby bottle, fill it up with whatever change that's in your cars, or underneath your seats, in your couch cushions, right? Just put it in this bottle, bring it back, and we'll turn it over to them um, as a way to serve our community. Um, oh, man. And then, uh, additionally, um, as a I think Gary brought up earlier, uh, Corbin's last Sunday, sadly, right? It's February 25th, right? So make sure you just, just trash him before he leaves, right? Just, <laughs> just stick it in his ribs, right? He can never leave, no. Um, we're happy for him. We're very proud of him and Sydney and just the moves that they are making and where God is leading them. Uh, but we want to send them off well. And so um, I want to encourage you to come early on February 25th. All right, we're going to celebrate them between our two services. So first service should get done around 10.05. Should, though, with a very hard should. Um, and then, uh, but we want to celebrate them in between those two services. And so we'll have donut holes. We'll have coffee, refreshments. But come, uh, maybe bring a card, right? Something nice, maybe your favorite scripture, a way to bless them or share prayer over them or whatever it is, right? But just come and support them as they say goodbye, all right? Um, but... What a joy it is to be back together again. Uh, if you were here last week with us, we started a new series on the book of Mark, all right? And so this is week number two. Craig Hug preached week number one last week, and he helped us open up the gospel of Mark to understand it, uh, of John the Baptist preparing the way. And he did such a wonderful job. I, I, I mean, going through the week, going through Bible study and prayer service, I just remember hearing all these people, Craig did such an awesome job proclaiming the word. And that's always a joy to hear, right? Because I wasn't here for second service. I was here for first service, but not second. I had the opportunity to preach across town at his house to kind of build our relationship with one another and build a community. Uh, and I heard that was not announced. And so we're walking in. I'm like, where were you? I'm like, oh, it's okay. Um, but hey, uh, I'm glad that we got to connect with his house and to build that relationship. Um, and then um, this Friday, I mean, what an exhausting week for for me and, and Gary uh, and our elders, uh, Friday we had our elder retreat, all right? Elder retreat was supposed to happen earlier in January, but then Michigan has this white stuff that falls from the sky, right? It's called snow, uh, and that derailed our plans for an overnight retreat, so we were going to try to do like a, like a half day or, and then that derailed our entire retreat in general, right? That heavy snow that we had, so we did it on Friday, and it was a great time of praying for each of you, right? All of you who, who are a part of of the membership or directory, even our visitors, right? We took time to pray for you on Friday. We took time to develop um, and to focus on the spiritual life for our elders, right? And so how they can be spiritually filled and, and nurtured so that they can provide you spiritual care and nurture. And so an awesome time, full of joy, full of exhaustion, but full of joy because this is what the ministry is all about, right? This is what the church, the body of Christ is meant to do is to support and care for one another. So I'm very thankful for uh, what we have here and what the Lord is doing. Um, but with that said, all of us come from our different places this week, right? All of our exhaustions, our joys, our sufferings, our hurts. And we want to come before the Lord, right? We want to open up His Word. We want to see how He has impacted our lives this week or, or what He's going to do in our life today, right? So if you would, if you would just lay aside, gently put aside the things of this week that may distract you in our time together in the next 30, 40 minutes, and just gently put it aside and open yourselves to God and His Spirit. I want to see what He can do through you today. So join me in a word of prayer as we prepare our hearts for a message. God, we give you thanks. Thank you for the opportunity for a new day. A new day to realize that you have created us and that you are looking down on us. You, you, you love us so much. And yet, Lord, each of us had our own things that went on this week. Maybe pains at work or with family or school. Maybe issues with, uh, with relatives or friends. Maybe we had huge joys in our life too. But Lord, you were present in every moment. So Lord, as we come before you, as we open up your word to the, to, uh, the end of Mark chapter 1 and Mark 2, would your spirit just fill this place? Would it fill our souls and, and, and guide our minds to dwell on the things that are good, to help transform us into the image of Jesus Christ? Lord, may the body of believers here, may we come around one another, encouraging, supporting, and caring for another in ways that we never thought were possible. Lord, lead us in this time by your Spirit 
and by your power. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. I'm always impressed, all right, when someone, like, buckles up, they, they, they dig deep, and they work tirelessly to change their life, right? When, when they change their life in a really good way, it is powerful to see. I, I think one of the most um, vivid pictures that, 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 that kind of comes to mind is when someone, right, when, when they go on a huge weight loss journey, right? And, and it's like, we, we all remember seeing those photos of people who, like, they have that pair of pants, and they can fit into one leg, right? It's like, that's impressive. That, that's, that's remarkable. Like, you, you put a lot of effort, you put a lot of uh, uh, just discipline into your life in order to change, right? In, in order to, to seek maybe healthier habits. And I think what, what seeing that does is it, it kind of helps us see, like, if they can do it, I can do it too, right? And it may not just be like a weight loss journey, Right? It could be like a developmental thing, right? Hey, like, I, I want to I grow in my faith, right? So uh, if, if they can read the Bible in six months, I can too, right? Or, hey, uh, you know, they can fix their marriage, I can too, right? We love seeing this developmental stuff, this improvement, and we like celebrating these things with people. It, it, it's, it's really cool. In, in millennial terms, or maybe Gen Z terms, it's also called a glow up. Have you ever heard of this? All right. So imagine um, a picture of you from like middle school or high school, and you look like a middle school or high schooler, right? Like, and, but then you get to college or, or, or young adulthood, and you, know, you start to get a nice haircut. You, know, you trim your beard up a little bit. You start to look better, right? Or maybe you're in adulthood, and you decide to start taking yourself a little bit more seriously. That's, that's kind of a glow up. And so I got a glow up example for you on the screen. So on your right will be uh, the old Chase in 2016. It's kind of a weird shaped photo, but Gary type hair and beard, right? (laughs) I'm kidding. Gary has a really nice beard. Um, But that Chase, that Chase on the right, he was like 240 pounds, right? And just kind of like, it's whatever. He did not have good habits. Chase on the left he moves some hair from here to here, right? Put on his chin. Um, but that chase is also 180 pounds, right? It's a very significant difference, you know, kind of in that glow up, making improvements, pushing forward, right? Enjoying life a little bit different. It, and that's kind of what this glow up sort of stuff is. We like to, su- to uh, celebrate people's physical transformations, right? We like to celebrate when positive things happen in people's lives, but then there's also the other side, right? We see people, and they don't get positive things. Maybe they go through some serious hardships, some serious struggles, and you're like, man, you're not doing well, right? How many of you have ever had to talk to a friend like, you doing okay? Is everything okay in life? Right? And, and, and it can be frightening. And the vivid picture that comes to my mind is like what they kind of try to fear monger into you in elementary school, like this video of someone who's just, uh, like, years of substance abuse, right? And just the, the toll it takes on an individual, right? Starting from, like, year one to year five, and just how it's just life has changed. Like, their face is concaved, right? right? They're just not attentive. They got scabs and lesions, right? Just substance abuse has just kind of racked their life, right? And it's like heart, our heart breaks, right? We don't want anyone to go so, through something like that. It's hurtful. It's painful. The impact it has doesn't just impact the individual. It impacts a lot of other people as well, and it's negative. And, and that sort of image is present in the stories that, that we're reading today. It's, there's a negative impact happening that is, that's been happening for a long time, and Jesus comes on the scene. All right? Jesus appears, and especially in Mark's gospel, Mark does not care. He does not care about the birth of Jesus, all right? He doesn't mention it. He does not care about Mary or Joseph, right? Doesn't write about them. He gets right down to business. He starts with John the Baptist, and then he says, John's arrested. Jesus, it's all you, right? And Jesus says, the kingdom of God is at hand. There's a new order. There's a new era that is happening. And the kingdom of God at hand is like approaching someone who's just been under years of abuse or neglect or oppression, and it approaches them 
and says, here, let's find life. And this is what's happening in the book of Mark. Jesus calls some disciples. He gets some new friends. He says, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. And they say, sure thing, let's go. And then he goes to a synagogue. And in the synagogue, he starts teaching. And in the synagogue is a demon-possessed man. And I remember Jim Wilson, we were in Bible study. He says, why would a demon-possessed man be in God's like, holy place, right? Like, Can they survive there? Can they operate there? And what Mark is telling us is that Satan had taken a lot of territory. And Jesus is winning it back. He's reclaiming it. And so this is the image that's happening, right? We're seeing the negative effects of sin, and Jesus is coming in, and he's ushering in the new thing. Such as Mark 1.15, right, tells us this. The time has come. This is Jesus. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. We have a new present reality, and Jesus brings it directly into frame. Jesus steps onto the scene, and he shows that he has authority in teaching. He has authority over the demons and demonic forces. He has power over sickness, and it is very clear to us that a new era of the church has begun. The kingdom of God is at hand, and the power of Christ has has revealed itself in his presence. And where we arrive today in our text our text will actually reveal miraculous events. And we're going to kind of do a flyby over three narratives, all right? But Jesus, he heals people, he forgives people, and he welcomes the outcasts, the sinners, the neglected. And God wants you to see this in our text today. He wants you to see this, that the kingdom of God, it brings comfort to those who have been alienated by sin or by situation. Christ has come to bring good news of freedom, freedom from sin, and freedom from the forces of evil. And for those of you who are believers in Christ, the good news is we can take hope because Christ has come to make you free. You are no longer, you are no longer shackled to the negative impacts of this world. You're no longer shackled to your sin. You're no longer shackled to your situation. He has come to make a new way for you. That's what we're going to learn today. And I think this, I believe this idea is prevalent in all three narratives we'll glance at today. And the first narrative talks about a man with leprosy. This man, at the end of Mark chapter 1, he hears of Jesus' healing power, and he deliberately and illegally goes to Jesus, all right? I don't know if you know much about um, Jewish law, if you've ever read Leviticus or maybe even just made a few verses in and said, that's not for me, right? Close it, I'll fill you in, right? Leviticus 13 gives some clean and unclean laws. And one of those is people with skin diseases, they are forced outside the camp. You're not welcome in, sorry. You could be a harm to everyone else, right? So go outside, wait till you're healed, Then you can come on back in, we'll call you clean, and things are good. However, here's the issue with leprosy. Leprosy is one of those diseases, true leprosy, where there really is no cure. In that day and time, it's a death sentence. They would often call you the living dead. And so this man, he deliberately and illegally wanders into the city in order to come face to face with Jesus, to touch Jesus. The unclean touches the clean. And what Jesus does, he says, you are clean. The leprosy fades from this man's body. An uncurable disease at this time fades from this man's body, and he is healed. And everyone sees this. So if you have your Bibles, right, turn with me to Mark chapter 1, verse 40. And that's where we're going to start this morning. And we're going to cover a period of text. Again, Mark chapter 1, verse 40. And as Gary said, If you don't have a Bible, like you don't have your own physical copy and you'd love one, you walked into the right building this morning. We got one for you, right? So find me or find Gary or any one of our elders after service, and we'd love to put a brand new Bible. We'll put your name in it. We'll give it to you, all right, to help you know God's Word, right? It's His Word for you. So again, Mark chapter 1, verse 40 through 45, if you'll read with me, it says this. A man with leprosy came to him. And begged him on his knees. 
If you are willing, you can make me clean. Jesus was indignant. He reached out his hand and touched the man. I am willing, he said. Be clean. Immediately, the leprosy left him and he was cleansed. And Jesus sent him away at once with a strong warning. See that you don't tell anyone this to anyone, but go, show yourself to the priests, and offer the sacrifices that Moses commanded for your cleansing as a testimony to them. Instead, he went out and began to talk freely, spreading the news. As a result, Jesus could no longer enter a town openly, but stayed outside in lonely places. Yet the people still came to him from everywhere. Now, right, we already kind of covered this. The, the man with leprosy did a really bad thing, all right? In Jewish law, like he is unclean, he's required to be isolated outside the camp until he is healed. Some of us know what that feels like, right? Uh, if you have, were, you know, alive in the last four years, you understand the words quarantine, right? Isolation at a different level than you did previously, right? I, many times, right, getting sick with COVID, you know, you had to isolate from others in order to, you know, make sure our symptoms didn't impact others. We know that feeling of isolation. We know that feeling of being locked away, right? Specifically with, with illness, right? But we may know it in other ways as well. But for the leper, this life was more difficult, right? The, the term here in the original language for leprosy, it can mean a whole host of skin diseases. It could be a general term, right? We have no idea if it was true leprosy or if it was not. But if it was true leprosy, his skin is literally rotting, right? It, it is, it is falling away. It, it, again, the living dead term is a pretty accurate description of what we're thinking here, right? He, there's little hope that he has. He is waiting out his days until he finally dies. And so this man, who is considered a part of the living dead, he leaves his isolation camp, right, with his torn clothes and his messed up hair, right? He leaves that camp behind. He wanders into the city, right? Imagine the looks he got walking in there, right? He weaves himself through this crowd to get to Jesus, and he sits down at his feet. He, he kneels down, and he begs him, and he confronts him, right? In Mark 1.40, he says, If you are willing, you can make me clean. Man, this guy showed such great faith in the revealed power of Christ and in the kingdom. Because let's think, like, what, what's probably going through his mind? I'm dead anyways, Right? Either I waste out here, right, until, until I'm dead dead, or I walk into the city and I ask for help and they stone me to death, or this guy heals me, right? What's there to lose? My life's miserable as it is, right? So he shows some faith. This guy who, he actually casts out demons and he heals people. And what's really powerful is Jesus' response. Now, if you have your own Bibles in front of you, uh, and maybe in a different translation than the NIV, uh, it might say a word like compassion or pity. Right? Jesus had compassion on the man. The NIV uses the word indignant, also known as angry. And your scripture may say that. Now, textual criticism is a fun science in, in the biblical world. I won't bore you too much with it. But we're taking all of these different manuscripts and we're trying to figure out what's the right word to put there based on, on the evidence we have, right? And so usually when it comes down to it, the harder reading is the most accurate one. And so the harder reading here, Jesus is indignant. Why is he mad? Who is he mad at? Is he mad at the man? Is he mad at the man for coming to him, asking him to be clean? I, I don't think that's it. Because what does Jesus do? He reaches out his hand and he touches him. I am willing. Be clean. So if Jesus is angry, if he's indignant, who is he angry at? Or what is he angry at? And I believe Jesus is expressing anger at the ravaging effects of disease and the social and religious ostracism that this man was experiencing. Jesus looked at the world in his day, and he had anger for the negative impact of sin, of sickness, and religious alienation this man experienced. Jesus shows anger and disdain for the result of a sinful and fallen world. He shows anger against the forces of evil, of death, and the devil. 
And I need you to know that Jesus, the Christ, he looks at your life and he sees the harm that sin, that the devil, that the forces of evil have caused on you. He sees how you grew up. Like, like for example, maybe he sees how you grew up in a very lonely and abusive household. He saw that and he's angry at it. Right? That's not a way for a child to grow up and to live. Or, 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 or maybe he saw like, how you're trying to fill yourself with things that never satisfy Right? And, and, and he is angry at those things. He's not, he's, he's not angry at you. He's angry at the desire in your heart to choose those things. And he wants you to choose what is good. He wants you to choose things that, are, that, that don't distort your capacity for, for, for love and for mercy and grace and justice. And so Christ is angry. He's indignant. But this is what I love, right? Jesus gets mad at the systemic oppression that evil has caused in this man's life, and he steps forward, and he doesn't leave him there. Jesus reaches out to this unclean man, something that, that is never done, right? I mean, how many of us in the last couple of years, right? Yeah, I got a cold. Ooh, stay away, right? Jesus reaches out, and he touches him. Now, Jesus would technically be unclean, Right? But what happens is Jesus reverses it. The unclean becomes clean, and the clean remains clean. Jesus, his power, he reverses the impurity of the unclean man, and he shows us a new era of fulfillment, where the Old Testament spoke of the promises of God coming to fruition in the future. Jesus is here, and he says, this is the fulfillment. The kingdom of God is at hand. And the same happens with you today. Jesus looks at your past. He reaches out to you. And he says, I'm willing. Be clean. He welcomes you to his kingdom. He welcomes you to his way of life. He provides good things to those who believe in him. He fights for you. He corrects you by the power of his spirit. He transforms you by the power of his spirit. I think of what Christ says to the woman in John 8, right? This woman who's, who's brought unfairly by the Pharisees before all of these people, and they pick up stones to stone her, and Jesus says, you who has no sin, you can throw the stone. Everyone drops their stone, they walk away, and Jesus is there, and she's, he says, I don't condemn you either. Go and sin no more, right? This is what Jesus does. He welcomes the alienated. He comforts them. He cares for them. And he's doing that for you as well. He has the ability today to do that for you too. You who have been alienated by sin, you who have been alienated by your situation, by the forces of evil that have been trying to press against your life and, and distort the goodness of God, Christ is reaching out. He says, be clean. The kingdom of God gives comfort to those alienated by sin and by their situation. And we see this idea confirmed in the next narrative as well. And this is one of the more famous miracles recorded. It's the one Jesus, uh, Gary read right, earlier. And, and, and Jesus is here. He's teaching in a home, and this home is packed. All right? It is filled to the walls. Right? There's no room. And, and, and it has all different types of people in there. Right? Your normal, everyday civilians, and then you have some religious leaders in the mix. And as Jesus is teaching, one, like one person may have had the ability to weave through the crowd, right? If you've ever been at a concert or Disneyland or any amusement park and you're trying to get to the front of the line, right? You can just shove your way through, like, and you find, you, sometimes I just follow someone, right? Someone who's bigger than me, like if Matt Hopper was here today, that's the guy I'm following, right? He's going to be my lead, right? Um, <clears throat> but there's no way, there's no way a paralyzed man with four friends are going to be able to weave through a crowd and get to Jesus, right? And so they think of a constructive way to get there. So they climb up on this roof, and this roof was easy to deconstruct and reconstruct, all right? It was uh, wooden beams about three feet apart and covered and put together by clay or dirt and straw, right? Easy peasy to, to put together. And so what they do is they just dig a hole in this three-foot section, and they lower him to Jesus' feet, they think, no harm, no foul, I'll just put it back together, you know, when we're all done, right? Easy. And so they put him in front of Jesus. And here, Jesus forgives the man first. 
and then heals him after some discussion with the religious leaders. And so if you want to pick up with me, we're going to start in Mark 2, 5, and we're going to read this section of text together. And this is what it says. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralyzed man, Son, your sins are forgiven. Now some teachers of the law were sitting there thinking to themselves, Why does this fellow talk like that? He is blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? And immediately, Jesus knew in his spirit that this was what they were thinking in their hearts. And he said to them, Why are you thinking these things? Which is easier, to say to this paralyzed man, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up, take your mat, walk? But I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. So he said to the man, I tell you, get up, take your mat, and go home. And he got up, took his mat, and walked out in full view of them all. And this amazed everyone, and they praised God, saying, we have never seen anything like this. Now, if this is the first time you've read this narrative or you think back to the first time you've ever heard it, you're probably wondering, why did he forgive his sins? The man is paralyzed. He's obviously looking for some sort of healing, right? It doesn't make sense. Like, Jesus, what are you doing? But Jesus does this. He leads up this scenario. He's trying to create some controversy, right? Jesus likes to stir the pot a little bit, right? He, he's bringing a new era, a new fulfillment. And so he's not just preparing the way, right? The way is here. The kingdom of God is at hand. Things are going to change. So the clean is going to touch the unclean. He's going to heal you, right? Jesus says, hey, I'm actually going to forgive your sins, right? If you're looking for healing, it may come later, right? He's changing things up. He's trying to get the religious leaders into a little bit of controversy. Because the reality is they don't believe in his power or they believe that his power has some sort of limit. Because for them, there is no way, there is no way that this man can forgive sins too. This is only reserved for God. Now, I don't want to get sidetracked with the paralyzed man uh, because of his sin, all right? Um, that's a discussion for a different time, but just generally, what this, what's happening here is it seems more in line that Jesus is proclaiming that the kingdom of God means full restoration of God's creation, both physically and spiritually. So Jesus is dealing with the root cause of all disease and death, which is sinful rebellion against God. And so he's doing this in order to bring true healing of mankind. But we can talk about forgiveness and, and sickness and all that uh, and sin at a later date and a later time. But you see, the religious leaders, they don't believe he can forgive sins. They actually question him in their heart. And Christ is discerning. He perceives their disbelief, right? He posed that question to them, right, in verse 9. He says, which is easier to say? To say to this paralyzed man, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up, take your mat, and walk? What's easier? And notice how he says, he, he doesn't say, um, what's easier to do, right? He says, what's easier to say, right? I, I could look at any one of you, and I could say this, right? If you would have applied to Harvard, you would have gotten in, right? That doesn't make it true, does it? But it's easy to say that, right? Because it's like, oh, I've never tried, right? Wish I would have, right? But it's easy to say that. It's not easy to say in front of a crowd of people who are expecting something, hey, get up, take your mat, and walk. Very different. Very different. Jesus, he, he said, he's saying something that's like a, the internal, right? Your sins are forgiven, and we're this external action, right? What's easier, internal or external? And we have no proof that, that the sins are actually forgiven, right? You can just say something, just like you would have gotten into Harvard. We have no proof of that, right? But yet, Christ goes for the jugular, and he says to the man, take up your mat and walk, and he does. And through this, Jesus shows he has authority in heaven and on earth to forgive sins, to heal the sick, to cast out demons, and to rightly teach God's word. And the proclamation of the kingdom of God isn't just about the salvation of souls, but it is the good news that God is reclaiming his creation. It is, it is reclaiming the negative impacts that devil, the forces of evil, the sin has had on the soul of the individual and taking it back and saying, I have power and authority here. Just as Christ had power and authority in the synagogue to cast out the demon from the man, Christ has power and authority in your life 
to reclaim what has been tarnished and destroyed due to sin. And I really believe some of you here today need to open yourselves to the power of Christ. Maybe you believe that you've done some bad stuff, you've experienced some bad stuff, or that you deserve the current state of your life, right? But here's the reality. Christ says the opposite. You are not the sum of your sins. You're, amen, right? You are redeemed, you are restored, you are renewed in him. Christ is the one who forgives sins. He is the one who goes to the cross so that you can be free. He is the one who comforts you in the midst of your alienation due to situation or sin. Christ reaches out and says, I am willing, be clean. Christ is the one who reaches out and says, your sins are forgiven. Get up, take your mat, and go home. And we also see it here in our final narrative. As Christ sits with sinners. And here we see the kingdom welcomes all people who see their need for help and healing. Jesus calls another disciple, but it's combined with the joyful invitation of, to outcasts and sinners who see their need for spiritual healing. So Mark 2, verse 13. And I promise we're almost done. All right? Mark 2, verse 13. This is the word of God. It says, Once again, Jesus went out beside the lake. A large crowd came to him, and he began to teach them. And as he walked along, he saw Levi, son of Alphaeus, sitting at the tax collector's booth. Follow me, Jesus told him. And Levi got up and followed him. While Jesus was having dinner at Levi's house, many tax collectors and sinners were eating with him and his disciples, for there were many who followed him. When the teachers of the law, who were Pharisees, saw him eating with sinners and tax collectors, they asked his disciples, why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? On hearing this, Jesus said to them, it is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners." And here in this final narrative that we're going to touch today, Jesus calls another disciple, a tax collector by the name of Levi. You likely know him as Matthew, all right? Levi could have been a secondary name, right? Uh, or it could have been a reference that Matthew may have been a part of the tribe of the Levites. Now, if you don't know anything about the Levites, again, if you gave up on Leviticus early on, that's okay, I'll fill you in real quick. Levi, all right, was one of the sons of Israel. His tribe is the priestly tribe. All right. And so, if you're a tax collector, which is a very hated thing, right, you're dishonest, you're corrupt, you're cruel, you're mean, right, you're, you're every bad word in the dictionary, right, if you're a tax collector. So, if you choose that life over a life of service to God, according to your family, you're doubly hated, all right? You've chosen really bad instead of really good, right? And so, we have this guy, Matthew, or Levi, who is likely doubly hated by those around him. And regardless, Jesus calls him from tax collecting into ministry, right? An unclean man to follow a clean one, an isolated, hated one to becoming an accepted and loved one with Christ. And so Jesus, he has dinner with Levi and his tax collector crew, right? These group of sinners and uh, ragamuffins, right? And it was an unclean thing to do to eat at a tax collector's house. And these religious leaders, they're astonished, right? The religious leaders at the time, they're obsessed with being separate from anything that would cause spiritual defilement. And I want you to know this. You should want your religious leaders, your spiritual leaders, to be obsessed with defilement, right? To be far away. They, you want your people to be holy and obedient to God, all right? You should want that in people who preach the word to you, who serve you, and who care for you. But here's the thing that went wrong for them, right? The, the Pharisees, Jesus isn't against their purity or obedience. Jesus is against them for their inconsistent and hypocritical ways that they worked out these goals. So they focused on the external things. They neglected the issues that mattered most to God, which is justice and mercy. So in concern for their own purity, they actually had lost heart for God's people in providing spiritual care for them. Think about the man with leprosy. He's outside the camp. No one's coming to him. He's unclean. He's unsought after. He's alienated. He's isolated. Think about the paralyzed man who's probably prayed for years and years and years, who has just desired to walk to be healed, and no care, no help, nothing. And then we get this group of tax collectors, these sinners, right? And they are astonished that Jesus would even be around them. And Jesus says, I have not come for the righteous, but for the sinner, right? We 
I have not come, right, for the healthy but for the sick. Jesus, the kingdom of God, welcomes in a new era. And it's an era that comforts those who are alienated by their sin and alienated by their situation. And Christ is reaching out to you today, too. He goes to the sick, the oppressed, the rejected. He offers spiritual care and nourishment. In Christ, he does that. In Christ, you have freedom from your sin. You actually have the ability to say no to it. It's not that he just paid the penalty for your sin on the cross, but it's actually he has released you from bondage. And he's given you the ability to say no. You know how powerful it is to say no? Right? It's a word I feel like often we don't know how to use. But he's giving that ability to say no and say yes to God. To, to live in virtue and in love. Christ has come and he's brought comfort in the midst of suffering. Right? Many of us go through hard times in life. But Christ, he is the firm foundation that gives us resilience and endurance and patience and perseverance in those times of hardship, in times of suffering. And he is the God who reaches out to us and says, be clean. He is the God who reaches out to us and says, you are forgiven. He is the God who reaches out to us and says, you are sick and I want to heal you. The kingdom of God is at hand. Christ has ushered in a new era. Are you willing to partake in the kingdom of God? Are you willing to live in the now of Christ? A now that lives life, pursuing holiness and goodness, of mercy and justice, of being transformed by the Spirit of God into the image of Jesus. Christ has welcomed you. There is no barrier. There is no barrier for the leper. There is no barrier for the, the paralyzed man. There's no barrier for the sinner. Christ welcomes you. Regardless if you've been alienated by your sin or by your situation. Don't let those things hold you back any longer. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we come before you and we just give you thanks for the work of Christ. Our God who has is, who is made a way for us, who has come to bring restoration and renewal and hope. Our God who, who reaches out to the unclean and says, you are now clean. Our God who reaches out and says, I forgive you, go and sin no more. Our God who sits with the despised, the oppressed, and the rejected of society. And Lord, many of times that, that feels like us. God, I'm not good enough. I've failed you again. I've sinned and I've lost my way. And that you welcome us back. You call us to that, to you. So Lord, give us endurance and patience. Give us foresight to see that, that with you there is a new way, a new way to live, a new way to be, and that you make things new. We don't have to live in the negative impact of sin and the forces of evil, but we can live in the goodness of God today. Would you lead us by your love, by your grace and mercy, God? In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Would you please stand and sing?
church, as we dismiss today, if I could have a few hands help us set up for the Super Bowl party tonight. I know football ended several weeks ago, but we're going to gather anyways. So if I could just get a couple hands to set up about two more tables in the back and then bring these couches in the front here, that'd be very helpful. But before we leave, I want to leave you with this from Hebrews chapter 13, verses 20 and 21. This is the word of God. It says, Now may the God of peace, who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good that you may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Go forward today, friends, in the kingdom of God. Take care.